Hi, I'm Brad Stone with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine, and today I'm on board the USS Constellation, the last uh, remaining ship of the Civil War Navy. I also have the honor of volunteering here, and I'm doing this presentation to talk about naval medicine and the important advances made during the Civil War that impact us to this very day. And um, this is a great ship. Um, again, it was around at the time of the Civil War, and we're in the sick bay area. This is the place where sick and wounded men would be taken to to be um, cared for by the ship surgeon. Now, the um, Constellation is a sloop of war. It's a fairly big fighting ship. And at that time uh, in the Civil War Navy, a ship of this size would have two surgeons, um, and, or at least two surgeons. And I'll talk a little bit more about the surgeons, but um, first let me talk about the sick bay area. Um, as you can see, it's not very big. Um, it's not designed to give long-term or comprehensive care um, to sailors. The other aspect of this is it's located in one of the worst areas of the ship. It's at the very bow of the ship. And I'll use this diagram to show you um, other aspects of how pleasant this is. So again, we're located here in the sick bay. And it is two decks below the top deck or the spa deck. So as you can see, it's fairly dark and dank. The other thing about it is it's at the very bow of the ship, again, which is the part of the ship that rocks up and down the most, and it's underneath an area called the manger. That's kind of directly above it. Uh, and the reason why it's called the manger is because that's where they have farm animals aboard the ship. Why do they have farm animals aboard a ship? Well, at that time, if you wanted to provide fresh meat, fresh milk or fresh eggs to your officers, that's where you got it from. So because of that, it often stinks down here. And then to make matters just uh, that much worse, one deck above us, we're also sort of underneath the ship's stove. This is a massive iron stove. It uh, prepares meals for the ship's company. It gets very, very hot all day. And a lot of that heat transfers down to the sick bay area. So to recap, the sick bay is often rocky, stinky, and extraordinarily hot. <clears throat> now you might ask, why are they having such terrible conditions in the sick bay area, the hospital area of the ship? Well, the answer is it's largely intentional. They want to prevent the men from what they would call malingering faking sickness in order to get out of work. So unless you're really sick, really injured, you really don't want to be down here. But in the event of an injury or a wound, you're taken here. And the good news is you're going to get good medical treatment. Because as I mentioned, there are usually at least two surgeons aboard these ships. And these surgeons are very well trained. The Navy is a federally run service at the time, before and during the Civil War, and they have very exacting standards as to who becomes a surgeon. You have to have graduated from a good medical school, and you have to go through a rigorous series of tests. Now, this is somewhat different than is the case with the Union Army at the beginning of the Civil War. They don't have the same same standardized way of weeding out who may be a good or mediocre surgeon. So the benefit to the sailors is that if they do need medical attention, they're getting it from some of the best doctors in the United States at the time. Now, what we're simulating here is a patient that's been wounded in a battle. And the Civil War Union Navy doesn't um, get involved in as many battles as the Army does. Um, a Union soldier is far more likely to be involved in active combat than a sailor is. But when a sailor does go into combat, it's a horrendous experience. Because unlike a soldier who always has the option of retreating, 
Sailors cannot. They're trapped aboard this ship, and it can be a very harrowing experience. One of the big difference between Union surgeons um, in the Army and Union surgeons in the Navy is what they have to contend with in terms of wounds. Now, in the Army, the big um, thing that wounds and kills uh, soldiers is this, the mini ball. And if you go to the Civil War Museum of Medicine, they have a very nice exhibit talking about just how devastating this bullet can be. But in the Navy, it's a far different situation. The thing that's most likely to wound or even kill sailors is the ship itself. What often happens in the early stages of a battle is that when an enemy artillery shell slams into the wooden hull of one of these ships, it's not the artillery shell itself that will injure or kill a sailor. Rather, it's the fragments of wood that will break apart from these ships or the bolts that will break apart from the sides of the ship that will hit and either injure or instantly kill a sailor. They are called secondary missiles, and they can be many inches or even feet long. Uh, these secondary missiles can be razor sharp, and again, they can do serious damage or outright kill you. So in this case, we're dealing with a sailor who's been wounded by one of these secondary missiles. It's hit him in the leg. And my job as a surgeon is to determine how badly he's wounded, what I need to do to treat him, and stabilize his condition till I can get him more than likely into port to um, get full comprehensive treatment for his wound. Now, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off my tunic, and I'm going to, or tunic rather, and I'm going to put on my surgery apron. So, as you can see, he's not my first uh, patient uh, in the aftermath of this battle. But I'm going to do what I can to give him the best treatment possible. Now, hopefully, he's, by the time he's reached me at the sick bay, someone has administered uh, or placed a tourniquet on his leg to stop uh, this wound from bleeding out. It's a substantial wound, so we don't want him to bleed out. Tourniquets are used during the Civil War. They're still used today in many kinds of injuries. Now, um, if you see Civil War, um, depictions of Civil War medicine in TV and movies, what you'd probably expect me to immediately do is pick up one of these. This is a bone or capital saw. And what you'd expect me to do is immediately start sawing on the patient's leg. The patient will be screaming, writhing in pain. Men will be holding him down, telling him to bite the bullet bite a strap of leather, or my particular favorite, somebody would be pouring whiskey down his throat. It's very dramatic, it's very moving, it's also pretty much false. During the Civil War, uh, virtually all operations were performed as they are today, under anesthesia. Now they have two principal drugs. One is chloroform and the other one is ether. On board a Navy ship, you are always going to use chloroform. Ether has a problem. It is extremely explosive. And if it comes into contact with any open flame, it will explode. That's not good for me, the surgeon, nor the patient. As you can see, as dark as this area is, all surgeries are always going to be performed under some sort of open flame. So again, chloroform is what you use. How do you administer it? Well, in most cases, what you're going to do is you're going to take a copper cone like this. You're going to place a piece of sponge or cloth at the top of it. You place it over the face of the patient, and as he breathes in, you're going to slowly add more chloroform or ether. After a few minutes, that should put him under so that he will feel no pain during the course of the procedure. The next thing you would do is you would take one of these. 
Uh, this is a stethoscope of the Civil War era. Now, stethoscopes are a fairly new invention at the time of the Civil War. They've only been around for about three and a half decades, but in that time, um, surgeons have become very adept at using them. And what I'm going to do is use it to check for what today we would call as vital signs, uh, particularly as heartbeat. I want to make sure that that's steady before I continue with the operation. So I'm going to give it a listen. And it seems to be beating robustly, so I'm going to continue. Now, as I mentioned before, he's not my first patient, as you can see. But before I use these forceps on him or any of my other equipment, I want to make sure they have a thorough cleaning. So please observe. <laughs> They're clean. So now I'm going to take these forceps, and I'm going to use them to pull out this secondary missile from the wound cavity. And that will allow me to examine the wound cavity, determine how badly he's wounded, and what I need to do. So let's say I find out that the wound is a relatively minor one, let's say a flesh wound. That's usually not a big problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take, um, you know, uh, suture material and stitch up his wound. Now, one of the preferred suture materials during the Civil War is this. This is silk thread. It is a very good suture material. In fact, we use it to this very day. I stitch him up and he should be okay. He may even be able to stay on the ship. Now let's say uh, there's a more you know, serious injury. Let's say a bone is broken, but it's a nice clean break. Here again, that's something that should be able to be taken care of. Um, what I would do is I would stitch him up. I would use uh, wood splints to surround the broken bone to make sure it mends properly and uh, he should be fine. But what if I find something more severe than that? What if I find out the bone is badly shattered into many pieces? Or let's say I find out that um, the damage done to the artery or veins is irreparable, or there are a lot of other pieces of foreign matter, let's say other pieces of wood or metal in the wound cavity that I cannot remove. Then, Unfortunately, I will have to amputate. And what is true is that in the majority of battle-related operations during the Civil War, they do end up in amputations. Now, it's not because the surgeons are butchers or bad doctors. The truth of the matter is the Civil War is fought a you know, long time before the advent of antibiotics. So they learn pretty early on in the war that under the circumstances I just described, Unless they amputate and do it fairly quickly, the patient's going to die an agonizing death from things like gangrene and sepsis. So they become very good at doing the amputations. On average, they can do it in 14 minutes or less. And the survival rate overall is very good, over 75%. Now, again, Civil War surgeons are not butchers. By doing these operations, they save tens of thousands of lives. But before I grab my capital saw, I have to determine, does he really need to lose his leg? So I've got to you know, um, examine the patient. This is in an age where they don't have x-rays, sonograms, MRIs, so how do you do it? Well, largely through probing the wound. And I do have instruments that can help me probe, but the primary thing I'm often going to depend upon is this, my finger. So again, I'm a good surgeon. I want to make sure my finger is clean before I probe with it. So I'm going to give it a thorough cleaning. There we go. I'm going to stick it in the wound cavity, look around as much as possible. And in this sailor's case, it's good news. It's a minor wound. So again, I'm going to stitch it up with this silk thread, and he should be fine. But I keep saying should be, because if you're observing this uh, procedure, you'll notice one crucial thing I'm not doing. I'm not really cleaning anything. I'm not really sterilizing anything. I'm not cleaning the wound. I'm not really washing my hands. Uh, you can see how I'm cleaning my equipment. Uh, I'm not wearing surgical gloves or a surgical mask. 
insure it again. I'm not doing anything to clean or sterilize this surgical <coughs> environment. Why? Well, <coughs> even though Civil War medicine is surprisingly advanced in many ways, I'm using anesthesia, I'm using advanced surgical techniques in terms of the amputations, it's still not considered to be in the modern age of medicine because it's the last major war where they don't understand germ theory. Germ thing, theory being the understanding that germs cause the transmission of disease. And so without this knowledge, they're not taking these steps. And this makes these surgical environments far more you know, risky in terms of infectious transmission than ones we would have today. Now, um, that means that even simple things like the silk thread that I talked about could be a source of uh, you know, contamination uh, and transmission of disease. So this leads me to what I hope is an interesting little side story. So as I mentioned, silk thread is the preferred suture material, uh, both among Union and Confederate surgeons. But increasingly as the war goes on, Confederate surgeons have a problem. Silk is imported from the Far East. That's not a problem for the Union. They can import as much of it as they want. But it is a big problem to the Confederacy thanks to Union ships like the Constellation. The Union has a naval blockade that is preventing <coughs> pardon me, the southern ports from importing silk. And that means that by the middle of the Civil War, the Confederacy is having more and more problems in terms of accessing silk thread. They have to come up with another material to suture wounds. And eventually, they come up with the idea of using this. This is horsehair. Horsehair seems like a horrible suture. Horses aren't particularly clean. But from the Confederate surgeon's per uh, perspective, that's not the problem. The problem is that horsehair in its natural state is very stiff. It doesn't tie well into knots, which means that the suture can come loose and the wound can open up. So they got to find some way of making horsehair sutures uh, softer, more pliable, more easily tied. They eventually develop the, the way of doing that, and that is by boiling it. And by boiling it, it does everything they want it to do and something they don't realize. It sterilizes it. And what will later be discovered is that the cons uh, Confederate surgeons who are using these bo boiled horsehair sutures have a far lower rate of infection among their patients than surgeons using other suture materials, including silk sutures. Now, just to put everybody's minds at ease, um, we know about germ theory today. So these silk sutures are sterilized before their use in operations. <coughs> pardon me. They are sterilized to be used before their, uh, pardon me. They are sterilized before their use in surgery. But I also want to mention that horsehair sutures are still used today in some procedures. So it actually turned out to be a good material. And ironically, this whole um, story is the one case that I know of in which the Union naval blockade accidentally ended up helping the South. So that is an overview of Civil War medicine, particularly in the Navy. In some ways, it's very, very advanced, but again, it's still not quite in the modern age of medicine. Hi, so thank you for watching this presentation. I think, I hope it's given you a good overview of what medicine was like aboard a Navy ship. I really encourage you to visit the USS Constellation, which is part of the historic ships in Baltimore, here in Baltimore Harbor. Again, it's an amazing ship. It's the last remaining ship of the Civil War. And I also, <coughs> pardon me, I also strongly encourage you to visit the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick. Again, a wonderful place to learn a lot about Civil War medicine. It's informative, it's fun. And in both cases, both in terms of the historic ships in Baltimore and 
the National Museum of Civil War Medicine. I would also strongly recommend you to get memberships to both of these fine museums to really get the most out of them. Again, thank you very much. Hi everybody, this is Brad Stone with the National Museum of Civil War Medicine and the Historic Ships in Baltimore with some added bonus footage. Uh, we're here down lower in the USS Constellation on what's called the Orlop Deck. And as you can see, conditions down here are even more cramped and dank. But in uh, preparation for a battle, surgeons would often set up their supplies down here in order to operate on patients during the battle. Why here? It's very cramped, very dark, but the benefit to being down here is that it's below the water line. So during the course of the battle, this is the safest place to be. It's very unlikely that enemy artillery shells would be able to hit the side of the ship below the water line. So as bad as the conditions are here, down here, during a battle, this would be the safest place to do procedures. Once the battle is over, then you would bring people up to the ship's um, you know, surgery room up at the sick bay. So again, I hope you've enjoyed your tour and uh, presentation about naval medicine here aboard the USS Constellation, one of the historic ships in Baltimore Harbor. And again, I hope you visit not only this ship, but the National Museum of Civil War Medicine in Frederick, Maryland. And again, if you really wanna enjoy both places, I recommend you get a membership. Thank you.